Welcome to Leading with Empathy and Allyship. I'm Melinda Brianna Epler, founder and CEO of Impovia, formerly Change Catalyst. I'm also the author of How to Be an Ally and your host for this show. Allyship is empathy in action. We learn what people are uniquely experiencing, we show empathy for their experience, and we take action. Want to learn more? Visit empovia.co, E-M-P-O-V-I-A dot co, to check out more of my work. Let's get started. Our guest today is Kareth Foster, CEO and founder of Inversity Solutions. Um, We'll be discussing diversity, equity, and inclusion work, the toxicity that can come to play while doing that work, and how we can use humor to improve the impact of our change-making work around diversity, equity, and inclusion. So, Kareth, welcome. I'm excited to have our conversation. Thank you for having me, Melinda. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, me too. Um, So let's describe ourselves for anybody who is on YouTube and is blind or low vision. So I'm a white woman with long red and blonde hair. I am wearing glasses. And in the background, I have, oh, and I'm also wearing a kind of bright, it's coming across this really bright blue (laughs) shirt today. And then uh, in my background on one side, I have a, a tall, skinny bookshelf with a plant cascading down it and some books from different guests that have joined us. And on the other side, a few plants are surrounding my book, How to Be an Ally, which has a, a bright orange cover. And I'm Kareth Foster. I am a self-ascribed Black woman, although I'm pretty much a mutt. I'm Irish, I'm West Indian, I'm Danish, I'm Native American. I'd say my coloring is a burnt sienna, if you will, in the crayon box. Mm-hmm. I'm sitting in a space in my office where I have light bulbs hanging behind me. And the containers that the light bulbs are in are, are multicolored from pink and gold and emerald green to black and blue. It sounds confusing, but it's actually quite simple. <laughs> I try to go for simplicity. My dress, on the other hand, is not simple. It is multicolored. It feels like silk, uh, but it wasn't the silk cost at the <laughs> when I got it. But it's one of my favorite dresses because it's just bright and colorful and comfortable. Awesome. Awesome. And today our interpreters, our ASL interpreters are Stephen and Haley from Interpreter Now. You can learn more about them at www.interpreter-now.com. So Kareth, can we start first with you sharing a bit about your own story? How did you come about to do the work that you do? Where did you start? Where did you grow up? And what was that path that led you to where you are now? Sure. So, I mean, if we're going back to the very beginning, I was born in Denver, Colorado. And I had a really interesting childhood experience in that the neighborhood in Colorado where I was, the block I was on, was incredibly diverse. The people to the right of us were Mexican family. The people to the black, were, to the left were black. The people across the street were white. There was a mixed race couple, Caddy Corner. There was an Asian family down the street in the coldest. It was like real life Sesame Street. Hmm. And, and we moved to Texas when I was seven, and I had the complete opposite experience. We were probably one of the only few black families within a several mile radius. I was always the only black person in any of my classes from. It's basically second grade on. And that continued even through my freshman year of college because I attended a a very small women's college in Columbia, Missouri. And I, you know, went through a lot of reckoning with being labeled, right? Being told at an early age, I wasn't black enough because maybe I didn't sound a certain way or didn't carry myself a certain way. And I really struggled with that. Like that actually was um, a very painful part of my upgrowing because I thought, well, but that's not all that I am. Why must you put that one label on me and that's it? And this actually was a trend that continued into my career, even as a comedian. You know, people want to be able to put you in a pigeonhole, what, you know, typecast you, literally. And because I, you know, wasn't sassy and rolled my neck and talking about baby daddies and doing the comedy that was on a certain comedy circuit, right? Like the Def Jam style. They didn't know what to do with me quite often. So I was kind of left in this no man's land because I didn't ascribe to what people could just put their finger on, right? And made them comfortable. Now, I always wanted to be a beacon of light and truth. I thought that was my path. 
So I thought, media, that's what I'll do. I'll be a journalist. So I got my degree in broadcast journalism from Stevens College in Columbia, Missouri. I did, I did study abroad at Oxford in England. And when I came back, I was working for a small ABC affiliate in Missouri. And then I got a call. My best friend was like, you got to come out here. Barbara Walters is starting this new show. I moved to New York to work for The View or what was to become The View. There were instances in both the local situation and the national level that I saw, okay, maybe you don't get to tell the whole truth in media. You know, I thought this was going to be this space where I could be an ex Oprah Winfrey or Connie Chung or Katie Couric. And what was a rude awakening was that you have to tell what the sponsors will allow, what the networks say is okay. But while I was there, you know, there are no accidents. I found stand-up comedy, or rather it found me. And comedy became a vehicle for my being able to express myself in a really authentic way. And I thought maybe this is how I'm supposed to bring people together through laughter, because it was just such a unifying thing and experience to, to be on stage and have everybody kind of coming together, letting down all the pretenses all the things that separate and divide us and just be in that space. And it's so cathartic and healing and universal. And it was, again, it was a vehicle for some really wonderful opportunities, traveling the world, performing all over. I mean, literally from Washington state to Washington, DC, I've done comedy and almost all the states in between. And there's something that comes with that. And if I could come up with a better term, I, I would, but master communicator. Because the number one rule in comedy is, yes, it's be funny, but it's know your audience. And if you're going to speak to people, if you're going to convey an idea, a thought, a concept, you have to be able to reach people where they are. You can't talk down to them and you can't speak over their heads. Otherwise, you're going to lose them. And so when I did come into the space of diversity, which did happen because of more career shifts, I knew I wanted to incorporate humor into that. And I know we're going to talk about that, but when I was pursuing comedy, at one point, my mom's like, please get health insurance. So I started working at Estee Lauder. I started temping. I was not planning to stay there for a long time. Ha ha, the joke was on me. I was there just under 10 years. <laughs> and I was in HR and was given the opportunity to climb the corporate ladder. At one point, I did say, this really isn't my jam, but I appreciate it. And I thank you. And I, I had a double life. You know, it was like a spy by day. I was, you know, white collar corporate girl. By night, I was a stand-up comedian, and um, I, I did leave Estee Lauder to start a production company that lasted about 20 minutes, and then I get a call saying, hey, Kareth, are you interested in a radio TV opportunity? And I said, yeah, of course. You know, what comic worth their salt isn't? And, and the gentleman who was a manager uh, had said, well, by the way, it's with Don Imus. And I, I said, I'm sorry, it was with What? And he said, it's with Don Imus. And I said, nappy-headed hose, Don Imus? And he said, yes. And I'm referencing the shock jock who got in trouble in 2007 for making those disparaging remarks about the Rutgers women's basketball team live on the air. Mm -hmm. And I remember watching it live and thinking, oh, I should have been there. Because I saw it from the comedian's perspective of riffing, trying to be funny off the cuff, not being able to vet it. And I saw it from the perspective of a Black woman who was, you know, taken aback. Like, that was completely inappropriate. But I remember this thinking, you know, when I got that call, this is my opportunity to be that beacon of light and truth. This is my chance to be the anti-stereotype. You know, there was no Oprah at that time. She didn't have her daily show anymore. She hadn't started her network. There was no Shonda Rhimes or Kerry Washington or Viola Davis. Not that those few women make up for a deficit. But you know, this was my opportunity to speak to an audience who probably never engaged with anyone like me on that personal level. And so that was what, you know, when I the call is to have a national dialogue about race and racism in America. And that was the catalyst that brought me to this space. And one thing that came from that was my scene, okay, wait, we've been doing diversity work going on 50, 60 years. Why does it feel like it's two steps forward, 10 steps back? Hmm. Mm. Yeah. And so you move from that into diversity, equity, and inclusion work eventually. Yeah. Yeah. Why? 
Well, there was another incident right after I left Imus, coincidentally involving a Rutgers University student, a young man by the name of Tyler Clementi, took his life by jumping off the George Washington Bridge. And I remember hearing that story and my heart just breaking because I have several friends who are gay, who are in the LGBTQIA community. And I just remember thinking nobody should feel that alone. For whatever it is, they think sets them apart from everyone else. Whatever it is, they feel it makes them an outlier, whether it's their gender, sexuality, their socioeconomic status, their religion. You know, nobody should feel that desperate, that that's their only recourse. And I thought, what can I do? How can I help? And so the first iteration of the work that I do was called Stereotyped 101. And it was programming that I created to take to college and university students hoping to share and spread the message that, look, we're all in this together. Like there are other races per se. It's the human race. Yes, we have different backgrounds, ethnicities. We come in different packages, but we believe the same way. We feel the same way. We know what it's like to be included. We know what it's like to be excluded. So let's create a space where we can have conscious empathy for one another and noble compassion. And that eventually... Stereotype 101 transformed into inversity because I was getting a lot of calls from people in corporate America saying, do you have anything for us? What about, you know, this audience? And, and that was kind of the beginning. I want to go deeper into some of what you said. The first question is, is, can you just explain a little bit more what you mean about conscious empathy and, and just say global compassion? Is that right? Uh, noble. No, nope. thank you. Thank you. So, Absolutely. Noble compassion. What does that, what does that mean? What does that look like and how do you develop it? Sure. So when I say conscious empathy, I think oftentimes people confuse empathy with sympathy. First of all, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. sympathy is when you feel bad for someone. Oh, what a shame. Too bad. Empathy is the idea of, yeah, putting yourself in someone else's shoes. Conscious sympathy goes deeper. Conscious sympathy is stepping out of that comfort zone right? For a little bit longer. It's saying, or at least asking two very specific questions. One, what is it like for them? And how might that feel? What is it like to be somebody like me, who was the only one for so long in these very social settings? What is it like to be someone who has to pray several times a day? What is it like to be a white person who didn't grow up around anybody but white people and now doesn't know the right words to use, questions to ask? What is that like? How might that feel? How might it feel to be in a relationship with somebody either because they are of another ethnicity, maybe they are the same sex, maybe they're, you know, that you can't share with your community or your family? How might that feel to be trapped in a body that you don't believe is really the one you should have? These are deep questions and we will never know exactly what it's like to be someone else. We're not supposed to, we're only us. But if you can take the time and the energy to go there, just to go there, to give that idea a chance of how that might feel and what that might be like, that's broadening your horizons and expanding your ability to have the noble compassion. Because very often we're, we readily will write people off. Well, that's not my life. That's not my lifestyle. That's not what I do. And since they're not like me, then it's not worth my time. No, that's not how this works. If we're serious about true inclusion, if we're serious about celebrating diversity, and you know, that's another thing. I think that we've done ourselves a disservice in how we've even approached the conversation around diversity, because for so long, diversity, I often say it's, people think it's a two-way street, right? One of the lanes is that it's solely about race or ethnicity, gender, and sexuality. And the other lane is that if we do it well, if it's successful, then everybody at the end agrees is on the same page. (laughs) That's the antithesis of true diversity. The idea should be creating spaces where people are allowed to be who they are, be their authentic selves. There's no indoctrination from any side. There's respect. There's honoring 
people, and there's valuing of our fellow human beings. Can you give an example of what that looks like, that respect, that honoring of each other? Well, it looks like my audience after one of my sessions. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> after I give a keynote or a workshop, yeah, and people feel engaged and inspired and connected, and they aren't hanging their heads in shame. They're not ready to go home and self-flagellate. They're not crying sad tears of guilt and of shame and of hurt because maybe they were made again to be the spokesperson for their marginalized group. It's truly a, a space of being allowed to be human and not having to apologize for it. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, you and I have talked before about the pitfalls of a lot of diversity, equity, and inclusion work out there. And while good intentions, a lot of programs, a lot of training, a lot of coaching doesn't work. Um, It can actually be damaging, can backfire, can move people backward versus forward. That the shaming, the guilt, all of those kind of really, those are kind of toxic feelings, emotions that are the worst motivators for change. When people are in those, they're much less likely to create change and it takes a lot to move through them, right? It takes a lot to get out of them. Um, you shared your thoughts with me a little bit about toxic diversity, equity, and inclusion. And, and I think you've shared some of, of that already here without naming that. But can you talk a little bit about what you mean by toxic? Sure. Media? sure. So, you know, I think something that we don't think about often is energy, right? And how energy is attached to things. It's attached to places. It's attached to people. It's attached to words. It's attached to feelings. And so we have to think about the energy that we're bringing to the table when we want to have something be successful. Now, success is defined differently by different people. For some people, success may be if people leave crying because they were put in their place, Mm -hmm. you know, made to think about something a little differently. For some people, in my case, success means people like had the aha moments. They had the spaces of clarity of, oh, I never thought about it like that before. I never saw it from that perspective before. Because let's be very honest, diversity is a very taboo subject because it's so personal. It's about every, it's about you. It's about who you are, your physicality, your abilities, um, your, your ethnicity, your, your, your sexuality is so personal. And for that to be put on the spot and called into question, you know, it leaves people just automatically on the offense or the defense. And so I think that when you can create a space and an energy that's neutral, first of all, just to start having a conversation, that's a win. But the toxicity can come into play when we think about the energy that comes with guilt, the energy that comes with shame. You know, who has ever been truly inspired to do more because they were, you know, somebody wagged a finger in their face and told them to go sit in the corner with a dunce's hat on, right? I mean, maybe they did it for optics, but they do it. Do they do it because it really penetrated their heart or they just don't want to look bad anymore? Mm -hmm. And I think that's where a lot of companies are operating from right now. You know, a lot of this is reactive versus proactive. And you know, while I find that unfortunate, that doesn't mean there's still not an opportunity to flip the switch and do some really, have some really good come out of it. So what does that look like to flip the switch? What does it look like to, instead of that, that finger pointing, instead of the kind of the negative energies, how do you change that into positive energy? Well, one of the things that I say, and I suggest always is, you know, it's really easy to call somebody out, right? Mm-hmm. You said that. You shouldn't have said that. You didn't use somebody's proper pronouns. You you can't use that term anymore. You know, you shouldn't act that way. You shouldn't think those thoughts. That's calling people out because they're not on board with you, right? right? Again, how effective is that? Is that really motivating someone to see your side of things? How do we call people in, mm-hmm. right? There's a Two small, very small words, but they're so significant. In versus out. That's why I came up with the word inversity. Even the word diversity, right? The root of it. I'll think of all the words that start with D-I-V. 
Divisive. Divide. <laughs> divisive. You know, divorce. <laughs> and we're expecting diversity <laughs> to do the trick. Interesting. What, so inversity is that flipping of the script, right? You know, yes, let's celebrate and honor all that we are, all that we bring to the table. Let's expand the traditional definition of diversity to include diversity of thoughts and ideas as well. And we're finally talking about neurodiversity. You know, there's so many aspects to diversity. Again, it's not just the gender and ethnicity and, and sexuality. It's so much more. So let's bring all those factors in. Let's focus instead of what separates and divides us to what is it we have in common? How can we be truly inclusive of one another? But most importantly, and I think powerfully, how can we be introspective, right? Meaning understanding your value and worth versus, you know, so that you can see it in someone else rather. You know, I think so often this work is about, well, you have to change. You have to, you know, change the way you think. You have to be a better person. It's all this external stuff, right? Mm -hmm. But the reality is we're not going to make any significant changes or moment movement until we we work from the inside out. And I wrote a book. I don't have it behind me, but I did the colors are kind of here. I wrote a book called You Can Be Perfect or You Can Be Happy. And there's actually a tie-in to the university work because you know. Spoiler alert, there's no such thing as perfection, but you can strive for excellence, of course. And happiness, you know, happiness is a choice. Now, is it the same for everyone? Of course not. And is it the same for us throughout the eternity of our lives? No. What made hey, you happy five years ago probably doesn't make you happy today. Or what makes you happy now may not make you happy in the future. But it is a choice. Now, there is a caveat. And the caveat is, Happiness is not a constant, and we think that it is, and I think that that leads so many people down a very treacherous path of, of depression, of disappointment, of, again, this beating yourself up. Something's wrong with me. I'm not on all the time. My life isn't great. It doesn't look like everybody else's Instagram or Pinterest posts or whatever. That's so tragic, and it's so not necessary, but again, we do strive for perfection because we forget, oh, we're human. We make mistakes. Nobody's perfect. But not only do we expect perfection in ourselves, we expect it in others. And when they let us down, mm. that's where the biases can especially come into play. Well, look at that group over there. I, that's, I knew they were going to do that. Or that's who they are. That's how they act. And, and we all do it across the board. Unconscious bias is universal. Mm -hmm. And it's not something that we'll ever fully eradicate. And, and that's okay. The idea isn't to completely rid yourself of something you can't help that's ingrained in you from generations back because it's about survival. The idea is to recognize when it comes into play so that you're not missing out on opportunities, experiences, or relationships. And also making sure that your bias isn't keeping someone else from missing out on opportunities, experiences and relationships. Yeah. And I think it also has to do with a calling out versus calling in too, because if we hold each other to perfection, then we're more likely to call somebody out for making a mistake versus having a growth mindset and kind of knowing that, you know, people may have grown up in places where they never have talked to somebody like Kareth. And, and so they just don't know and to help them learn and grow and change by calling somebody in. Right. Yeah. Can you talk about how humor can make a difference in your work? I think I can have a go yeah. at <laughs> I think humor is one of the greatest gifts that we have been given. And I think so, not just because I am a comedian and have been doing that for 25 years. Yes, I started when I was five. That's why you see no wrinkles. <laughs> I'm kidding. I was like 20. <laughs> But I, I honestly, it's it just what better way, what more positive way to lift people's spirits, to create a physiological effect, right, that triggers uh, serotonin and dopamine, you know, the, the happy hormones, right, so that people are in a, a place where, you know, one of my mottos is laugh, think, grow. 
Hmm. Because if you can laugh at something, you're not, you know, in a place to take it super seriously. Not that diversity isn't serious. So I don't mean it in that respect, but you're not looking just for the negative, right? You're in a space of, okay, this is universal. This is a human experience. And of course, humor is subjective. There are different types and styles of humor. When I perform or present, especially in a corporate setting, it's corporate clean. You know, I'm not going to be going out there with anything that people would, you know, gasp, clutch the pearls about. (laughs) But the idea is that, you know, humor is cathartic and there's a healing to it. And most people who are, you know, into comedy, whether they've done stand up themselves or they're a fan of it, they know that so much of it actually really comes from pain. And it's that pain that is also universal right? That pain of being disappointed, that pain of being hurt, that pain of being left out. I mean, think about also how many of like the top famous comedians came from people who have a heritage of pain, you know, Black comedians, Jewish comedians, you know, now we have a lot of LGBT comedians coming out and sharing their stories of their childhoods that, you know, sometimes sucked. But guess what? Nobody's had a perfect life. So that aspect is universal as well. And when you can use humor as a tool, it makes people more engaged. Like I, hopefully everybody remembers their favorite teacher or instructor or professor who was fun, who you just couldn't wait to get to their class. You couldn't, you know, and not only were you excited to be there, but you retained more because you were open. That's what humor does. So if you're going to have a topic as serious as DEI, DEIB, don't you want people taking it home with them? Not because they feel bad, but because they, again, it touched them on a much deeper level. And so that's that's the power of humor. Mm. Yeah, I've also noticed that humor, there's so much fear that comes into play when we're talking about identities, when we're talking about diversity, when we're talking about equity. And and I think that the yeah, humor can also put people at ease, partly because of those hormones that are being released, I think. And uh, you know, you open that opening, I think is really key to this work. And and when you have that opening, you have vulnerability, you have that ability to step in and be vulnerable, that ability to step in and be authentic and and to be a part of the conversation, no matter who you are. You said two key words, fear and vulnerability, right? Mm -hmm. And I think often people think they go hand in hand, but the reality is vulnerability is probably one of the bravest things that you can bring to the table. Because what you're doing is you're saying, look, I don't have all the answers. I'm not a perfect person. I'm going to make mistakes. I'm going to misspeak. I'm not always going to know the right, you know, things to do and say, but I'm open. I'm open to learning. And if you can, in return, be open to teaching, be open to allowing me to be human, and I can do that for you, like we can have a really successful symbiotic relationship. And I, I think, you know, one of the downfalls I've seen with how diversity is gone is that there's almost been this creation of hypersensitivity. Hmm right? Where there's a reward and there is a reward for everything that we do or we wouldn't do it. But there's a reward now in how offended can you get? How offended can you be? Not just for yourself, but for someone else. And I find that very interesting when someone gets offended on my behalf, who doesn't have my experience, who may not have the same background. And in the name of it being maybe, let's just say racist, right? Well, aren't you robbing me of my agency and my ability to decide if that's something that bothers me or not? So where's the line in all of this, right? Where's the common sense? Where's the reality of what is, should we be giving our attention to? And and should we be just, you know, dismissing? Because, you know, I think I wrote it in a blog recently or an article that it feels like 
we've kind of come to this place in society where there's a lot of chicken little and boy who cried wolf. Mm -hmm. We're almost like a hybrid of that. And my concern is not that there aren't things, because I don't dismiss the idea that racism and sexism and homophobia and trans, like, I'm not saying those aren't real and they don't exist. At the level that maybe it's, we're being told by the media, I question that. But what I have issue with is that if we're going after all the small things, if we're going after the little tiny things, then when the big things come that we sh that really should demand our attention that are not acceptable, then we're going to be out of energy and we're not going to have anybody coming to the table to say, you know what, this isn't okay. This isn't right. There needs to be a correction. Mm, that's a good point. And th perhaps also a little bit desensitized as well. Yeah, that's a really good point. So have it, you the the first step is creating that safe space for everybody to be human. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And uh and I actually I love that you use the word safe space because I get it. I get where the term comes from. But I think oftentimes when we say safe space, what that's also doing is creating a place where ideas that you don't like or don't agree mm -hmm. with or are upsetting to you aren't allowed in. And I don't think that's helpful either. So I say brave space. Let's have brave spaces. And by that, I mean spaces where, yes, you are allowed 100% to be you and who you are, but you're also brave enough not just to share your thoughts and ideas, but to hear contradictory thoughts and ideas. Because that's also where the growth comes from. You know, and I, that doesn't mean we agree, we leave holding hands, singing kumbaya. But what it does mean is we are closer to understanding maybe where other people are coming from. Yeah, and I, I would say it's both. You, you have to have those safe spaces. You have to have a space where somebody feels safe in order to be brave. I, Absolutely. I believe you have that psychological safety first and foremost. And safety does not mean a lack of contradiction. It does not mean a lack of uh, challenge, being challenged. But I don't think a lot of people realize yeah. that. I, yeah, I think that's absolutely. a word that's kind of been twisted as well, psychological mm -hmm. safety. And, you know, I mean, when people say words are violence, I get, you know, that's like, wait a second. Yes, words are powerful, but they're also only as powerful as we allow them to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What else? I mean, I, I have asked, actually asked all the questions that I had for you, except a few final questions. But is there anything else that we haven't talked about that you wanted to make sure that we do when it comes to to the topic at hand? You know, I mean, if there's nothing that comes to your mind. I just, I think it's just very important that people understand that this is not an overnight scenario. And I think we live in this time and age where instant gratification, right? We want it immediately and we want it right now. And this, a lot of the things that we're talking about has been in the works for a while. A lot of that you know, people have learned behavior, people have learned language, people have learned, you know, how to see things. And, and they've grown up for, you know, years, decades with certain perspectives. And so to expect people to have flip the switch instantly and get it, not only is that an immature, I think, ask, it's, it's very naive. And we have to have a little patience with one another and with ourselves. And this is where we need to bring kindness and grace into the conversation. And that's not always easy. I mean, I, I'm not going to tell anybody here that it's easy. Just psh, it's not, it's hard. It's hard, but this isn't, it doesn't have to be hard if you don't let it be like, it's what I say. One of my mottos is it's not hard work. It's heart work. And when you can go into your heart, when you can open your heart to someone else, especially somebody who has just so completely opposite views than you, you know, maybe someone who's angry, maybe somebody who's mean and cruel. Now, I am not charging anybody with being anyone else's therapist, psychoanalyst, but one thing I do know is that hurt people hurt people. Right. Right. So there's always a story behind it. There's always something there. And you probably do have more in common than you don't. And that's the goal of adversity. I love that. I love that. 
Do you have any recommendations for how each of us can think about using humor and tapping into that? Absolutely. Well, if it's funny to you, it's got to be funny to somebody else. And humor is tricky. Like, I'm not going to lie. It's it's something that I've crafted over, like I said, the past 25 years. And not everybody is readily a comedian, but not everybody has to be. You know, we can find humor in memes. We can find humor in but it's it's tricky because it is subjective and not everybody holds thinks every the same things are funny. But the idea is it will never be funny if it's just blatantly cruel or mean. Mm. And and you stay away from that, right? And you know, self-deprecating humor always works. That doesn't mean you're like ripping yourself up, but it's just, you know, making fun of something that happened in your life. Like I I was just on a, a podcast earlier today and we were talking about, you know, when I was getting ready for my children when I was pregnant. And one of the books I read were Toddlers Are A-Holes. I remember thinking, who would write such a thing about beautiful, these gifts from God, right? And then I had toddlers and I'm like, oh, she knew what she was talking about. You know, teach me sensei. I'm like, but they don't stop there. The other day we're in the car and I was listening to um, 80s on 8, like on Sirius XM because I'm a product of the 80s. And I think it was like, uh aha, or something like take on me. And I'm singing. And my older daughter, who's 10, goes, is this another one of your songs from the 1900s? The the 1900s? (laughs) Are you serious? Like, when I think 1900s, I think like Little House on the Prairie, right? Like, that's the 1900s, not mommy's music that she loves. (laughs) But it's just, it's one of those things. Like you can find humor everywhere if you look for it. Just like you can find offense everywhere if you look for it. You can find hurt everywhere if you look for it. You can find love everywhere if you look for it. You know, where your attention goes, energy flows. And that is something I think we need to have in the forefront of our mind when we have so much attention and energy going to the negative stuff. Mm. And so what action would you like people to take coming away from our conversation? Well, I would love people to, you know, look up what I do. (laughs) Mm -hmm. That was my next Uh, question. You can tell them where where they can learn more. But just, you know, be kind. Be kind. Don't think you know all the answers or you have to have all the answers. Again, make this such a, a finite thing. You know, we are, this is life. Life ebbs and flows. Right. And that doesn't mean that you have to give up your belief system. Like, that's one thing I I really do try to stress. Like, I don't want people to change their beliefs because this isn't about beliefs. It's about behavior and how we treat one another and how we act toward one another. And that that's what this is really about. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, if you could be kind, even sometimes when you don't feel like it, like you have no idea what somebody's day has been like. You don't know what's going on behind their screen. You don't know all of who's in their family. You know, we don't know everything about everybody. So don't don't make the assumptions. Um, But kindness, kindness always prevails. And where can people learn more about you and your work? So there are not too many carrots out there. Um, My name is K-A-R-I-T-H. My last name is Foster. And um, so all of my handles essentially are at Kareth Foster for Instagram, for LinkedIn, Twitter. I have the company Inversity Solutions. And that's I-N-V-E-R-S-I-T-Y solutions with an S dot com. And I'm out there. I mean, you pretty much just have to Google me. Might even get to see some comedy. But I I, I so appreciate your having me on, Melinda. And what a lovely conversation, even though I did most of the talking. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way it is. Yeah. Conversation an opportunity to share and spread goodness in the world. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for doing your work. And uh, yeah, I really appreciate you. And um, for all of you listening or watching, please make sure that you're learning and taking action. So that's be kind, laugh, think, grow, right? Really think about how can humor make a difference in your work to create change as an ally, as an advocate, and then find one thing that you can do and take action. See you next week. Thank you for being part of our community. 
You'll find the show notes and a transcript of this episode at ally.cc. There you can also sign up for our weekly newsletter with additional tips. The show is produced by Impovia, a trusted learning and development partner offering training, coaching, and a new e-learning platform with on-demand courses focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion. You can learn more at impovia.co. That's E-M-P-O-V-I-A dot co. Allyship is empathy in action, right? So what action will you take today? <laughs>